I am seeing 632, so I will call the meeting to order and we can get started. Ah, here's Sal. Excellent. Hi, Sal. Okay, since we're all appearing remotely, we all need to start by introducing themselves ourselves. I'll introduce myself, Jack McCullough, Mayor, and then we'll start over at uh, Donna's end of the horseshoe. So, Donna? Uh, Donna Bay, District 1. Harry Brown, District 3. Sal? Uh, Sal Alfano, District 2. Uh, Tim? Tim Heaney, District 3. And Ellen Cohn is not present. And Lauren Hurl from District 1. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll mention uh, the meeting logistics and briefly, anyone who is participating remotely, which is to say everybody, please set your uh, your name to be your full name and uh, so that we can get you on the minutes right. Um, anyone who's uh, called on to address the council, please uh, state your name and where you live again so we can get you in the minutes. We ask everyone to keep your any comments you make to under three minutes. And if you're speaking about a specific agenda item, uh, keep your comments relevant to that item. Anyone who wishes to be recognized must be called on and recognized by, by the mayor. And uh, <clears throat> you may make a statement or ask questions, but if you have multiple questions, please get them all out at once. Anyone speaking? Out of turn, discussing non-germane topics or exceeding the time limit uh, may be interrupted. And Donna Bate, our uh, council member, will uh, help us with uh, with keeping track of time. Uh, Jack, if yes. I may know, my uh, yellow orange doesn't have one minute on it, but that's what it means. And okay. the red means time to stop. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. The first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Has everyone reviewed the agenda? And is there any, are there any proposed changes? Okay, the agenda is approved as uh, as circulated. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any item or any topic that is not on the agenda. Again, we ask you to be to raise your hand either electronically or physically to be recognized, and I will keep an eye on the participant list to make sure that I I don't miss anybody. But uh, I'd ask anyone else to chime in if 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 you if I've missed somebody. Um, again, the time limit for general business and appearances is. Uh, is three minutes. So is there anyone who wants to address a topic that is not on the agenda? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone raising their hands or requesting to be recognized. So, uh, We'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there any, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? I make a motion to move, approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Well, no. Just one question before you um, vote. I, I, we did get a, a question from a constituent. I see that um, they are on the call. I just want to make sure they got the answers to their satisfaction. So, great. Thank you. And that's yes, Linda. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any other question or any other discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Consent agenda is approved. Next item on the agenda is item six relating to the uh, update from Casella on the uh, leachate treatment. Bill, do you want to kick that off? Ah, is, and I assume we have someone here from Casella. Yeah, I'm going to hand that directly off to uh, DPW at uh, Casella. I see Sam is on, and I'm not sure if 
think our DPW folks are here. Uh, so, yep, this is this is Kurt. Um, I'll try to do my camera here. I'm on my phone on computer issues. Uh, so yes, um, as I wrote in the um, on the cover sheet, um, the initial deadline for a leachate treatment was July first. Um, Casella came and did an update, and uh, that was uh, extended until tonight's meeting. And um, the main concern was the status of permitting. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Casella to um, give it a, an update on the status. Thanks, Kurt. Okay. Great. Thanks, Kurt. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Great. I'm Sam Nikolai with Casella, and Joe Gay is uh, with us here today as well. I uh, appreciate the chance to come in and give you an nice update. You may recall we um, talked during the May 24th uh, City Council meeting uh, about the status of our treatment system. At that time, we were awaiting one last permit, which would allow us to proceed forward. And we told you that we expected to get that permit fairly shortly and to be proceeding with the installation of the building and the treatment system uh, later in 23. Uh, we're really pleased to report that uh, we did uh, get the permit in the time frame that we expected. The Act 250 permit was received on June the 30th. Uh, we appreciate that the city uh, weighed in and um, indicated that you'd like to see a timely uh, decision by Act 250, and that was certainly the case. Um, Act 250 did move forward. So that is the last permit, major permit, that we need. The, I'm also thrilled to uh, be able to tell you that the building is on order and the contractor is lined up. The treatment system is ordered and we expect uh, to receive it um, a little bit later this fall, uh, probably in the August timeframe. Uh, and we expect to be uh, installing and running a little bit later this year. So we're consistent entirely with what we shared with you in May. Uh, we're really excited about it. Uh, we believe that um, this will be a great solution for treatment of leachate and uh, will allow us to continue to operate uh, you know, a state-of-the-art facility uh, here at Coventry um, and continue to work with the city. Um, so happy to take any questions, but, but, but really pleased that we're on track uh, and, um, and moving forward uh, both with permitting and construction. Thanks, Sam. I think we're all happy when we got the news that you got the permit approved. Um, is just just for the sake of being potentially pessimistic, and I'm not a pessimistic guy. What else could ha could go wrong between now and when you start building? So we've done a pretty thorough evaluation to try to prevent that from happening. Um, we have the ability uh, already to um, set up a treatment system uh, within an approved area. So if the building is delayed, uh, we have the ability to, to move forward without the full construction of the building. Um, but uh, with Joe here, he's done a great job of getting in front of this, having a contractor lined up, having our treatment system basically ready to go. So we feel really good. <laughs> uh, you know, we always worry like everybody does, or, Will we see some more flooding? Will we see some other crazy things that could happen to us? Um, but, you know, barring something really unusual, we believe that uh, the treatment system will definitely be on site and running. We will certainly have kinks to work out. So even when the system is running, you know, week to week, um, you know, we will, during that initial startup, you know, we're going to have to, to work through those and, and ensure that, you um, everything is running properly before we get to 100% continuous flow. But we feel really good about it, uh, as, and I feel strongly that um, we've prepared ourselves for contingencies and are on track to, to have the system running. Thanks. Um, any other members of the council have questions? Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, great to hear that update, Sam. Um, just two quick questions. One. Just remind me, so this is going to be a pilot project to begin, um, and would the leachate coming to Montpelier be the pre-treated that's going through the pilot, or would you be sending us untreated as you're doing the pilot program? And then my second question is, I know there was a, um, there's 
I, something about a lawsuit or get, uh, regarding a NIPTES permit, does that intersect with this at all? Or does that raise any potential concerns down the road um, that would intersect with this project? Or would that have any potential to derail the pretreatment? Great questions. So and can I jump in before you answer that? Uh, for those of us who are not environmental experts like uh, Lauren, what's that permit that you uh, mentioned, NIPTES permit? What's that? Sure. So I'll tackle the first question first. Um, our goal in our commitment to the city is to, to bring you treated leachate as quickly as possible. So our goal is to run the system to be able to treat the leachate and bring the treated leachate to Montpelier. It is true that um, there's nothing stopping us from bringing a mixture of treated and untreated and is likely to, to have that occurring while we're doing startup. But our goal is to treat leachate and treat as much leachate as we can and bring Montpelier treated leachate. And our expectation is that we will be doing that in 2023. So um, there's certainly no reason not to try to, um, to be bringing you treated leachate. Um, so the second question, so what is a NIPTES permit? A NIPTES permit, um, National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, if I get my acronym correctly. Um, it is a permit that derives from the federal government down to the states that allows um, discharges to occur. Um, there has been some back and forth at the landfill about a NIPTES permit, but it has nothing to do with the system. There is a uh, underdrain at the landfill, which is totally unrelated to leachate. And there has been much discussion about whether that underdrain should be regulated by a NIPTES permit. And ultimately the, the agency decided that it would, was not the case. But regardless of that outcome, it does not and has never had anything to do with leachate or leachate treatment. It really is a totally separate project. Um, we are essentially discharging under a NIPTES permit. We're discharging under your NIPTES permit. The city has a NIPTES permit for its discharge into the Wadooski. And so our leachate, by virtue of going to you uh, under the first the pretreatment permit, and then ultimately is discharged under the city's permit, uh, not our permit. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, go ahead, Lauren. Yeah, yeah, that does. Thank you. That is really helpful. Um, just back to the first point then. Um, so we had, as a council, um, established a target of 20 parts per trillion in line with, you know, what was what is the state's drinking water standard as a target for the leachate. Is that going to be feasible to meet given that you know, once you have the system online, and even if there's some mixing, if it's getting most of it out, or are you looking for a a change to to that? Just trying to understand what you're going to be asking for from us. So our goal certainly is to get as much PFAS out um, as possible. So, so far, our testing has gotten uh, the five compounds individually down under into single digits. So we're getting the five compounds individually under 20. Now, the drinking water standard is the sum of the five compounds for, for 20. So our goal is to get there. Now, um, leachate, whether treated or untreated, is not drinking water. <laughs> no one will be drinking those. But, but Lauren, to your point, that has been our goal is, is to get to that point. We're not going to know exactly if we're able to achieve that goal precisely, or if we're going to be a little bit higher than that until we actually go through the pilot testing. But we know that we're going to be really, really close because we're already producing uh, levels in single digits. Um, and um, I think our best results are sort of in the 30 to 50 range. We think as we dial that in, we're going to get even lower. But ultimately, you know, the, the agency has asked us to do this pilot test work to figure out how close and how low we can get with this technology. So we're thrilled that we're going to be getting 98, 99% removal. Our goal is certainly to get it as low as we possibly can. Thanks. Um, any questions for any other members of the uh, council, uh, Tim? Thanks, Chuck. Hey, Sam. So a couple quick questions, just in terms of the Act 250 permit, is there an appeal period that follows the issuing of that permit? There is, um, I believe, the 
uh, general standards of 30 day appeal period and that permit has been appealed. Um, so we, uh, uh, being the, the public uh, company that we are, we frequently have our, our permits appealed. Um, so um, that along with many of our other permits are in the appeal period. Um, that doesn't stop us from being able to move forward. Um, that appeal process will work. And if someone determines that adjustments need to be made, then we have to act at that time. But from the agency's standpoint and our standpoint, we are good to go um, only if, if there is a successful appeal, what, could there be a change? Okay. Is the equipment that you're using, is it something you already have? I, I assume it's specialized equipment and just knowing my experiences lately with getting anything specialized or even garage doors, um, you know, elevator control cards are 20 weeks out. I mean, what's, you know, is, is it really realistic to have this done this year? It uh, is. We, um, we intentionally uh, did our testing with equipment um, in advance of, um, you know, the permitting as we could. So we knew that the treatment system that we wanted, we've had reserved. So it's, it doesn't need to be manufactured. It's sitting on the ground. So it's literally has to be shipped to us as opposed to actually being manufactured. So we're absolutely on track to get the equipment. We do not expect any delays there whatsoever since the equipment already exists and is literally sitting on the ground to be shipped to us. Okay, thanks. Any questions from any other members of the council at this point? Okay, looking to members of the public, I see Casey Whiteley, you've got your hand up first. And you are still muted. Thank you, thank you, Mayor you and um, and Sam. Um, Sam, I had I wanted to ask a question about um, a concern that uh, I and many other people have about potential hazards of the treatment system up there, um, potentially leaching it, those toxins leaching into uh, the surrounding watershed, namely the Black River and the South Bay of Lake Mefermagog. I just wonder how that, how you're accounting for that, and how how you propose that that will be contained uh, from having an impact on a further impact on the environment. So the leachate, by regulation and and uh, as well as our own standards, has to be managed in a way to prevent it from spilling. And that's the case whether we're just storing it, whether we are pumping it somewhere, or whether we're treating it. And so the treatment system has to meet the same requirements that we do today for all of our leachate, which means it's got to be within tanks, it's got to be within storage areas with secondary containment. So the treatment system itself doesn't change anything uh, on the site in terms of how we manage leachate. Leachate is, will continue to be collected, it will continue to be put into tanks and containment areas that prevent it from being discharged. And once we treat it, it goes back into a tank so that it can then be hauled for, for disposal. So we're very confident in our ability to manage the leachate in a way to prevent any potential release. The treatment it will lower the concentrations, which will make the, the receipt of the, the material um, more amenable for the city's wastewater plant. Um, but nothing uh, will change in terms of the site's ability to manage leachate uh, properly and keep it contained. We're very confident in that. It's critical for us to, to continue to manage that leachate correctly. Thank you. I just I just want to um, also express, you know, the knowledge that the leachate has has leached into Lake Memphremagog, and everybody knows that. So um, I just want to make sure that there's um, additional accommodations being made for this treatment that will prevent that from happening again. I appreciate your comments. I, I have to strongly disagree. No leachate has ever made it to Lake Memphis Magog, and we have continued to operate the facility in a way to ensure that will never happen. So I know that there have many, been many folks that express concern, but we are very confident that the lake has never been impacted by leachate, and that we will continue to manage it in a way that, that prevent that from happening. I just want to I appreciate your your point of view and and your commitment to that to that view, but I. I um I just want to go on record as saying that we know that PFAS have been found in Lake Memphis Magog all the way up to Magog, and so um, I just want to I just want to say that that's that's you know been confirmed. 
PFAS have certainly been found in surface water bodies, which include like went from Agog. There are a lot of sources for, of PFAS, as we all know. It's coming from industry, residential areas. Again, we're very confident, and the agency is very confident that we're preventing any releases to the lake. Great, thank you. Um, Linda. And you're also muted at the moment. Yeah, there thank you. I have questions for the council. Um, leachate contains high strength organic waste, which causes odors. The current odor control system in place after phase one upgrade to the plant was complete. Uh, uh, upgrade to the plant was completed, was not meant to filter le a leachate tank, is undersized for the volume of material it was expected to process after phase one, and is, poor, in, is in poor condition and is not fully functional. The timeline for constructing an appropriate odor control system is December 2024 to December 2025. So my three questions are one, why aren't you suspending processing high organic waste until a city is fully in compliance with the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation Air Pollution Control Regulations? Number two, what entity authorized again accepting leachate from Casella and when did this recommence? And three, is Casella's leachate the only leachate we take? And if not, what volume of additional leachate is coming into the plant? And does the total amount exceed the designated capacity of the plant? Kirk, this might be an answer, a question for you. For starters. Uh, yep. Yep, I can jump in on that. Um, so leachate is not considered high strength organic waste. That's really the, the food waste material that we're taking in, the fats, oils, and grease primarily. So it's a, a really a totally separate process to handle the high strength organic waste. Um, it's true that we have uh, odor control issues associated with the high strength organic waste. Uh, the phase two upgrade will address that. We are also planning to include um, <clears throat> odor control on the leachate tank itself. Uh, mm -hmm. But we don't believe that leachate is the primary uh, it's source of odor issues at the plant. I think it's actually very minimal based on the testing that we did. Um, right now, we're only taking leachate uh, from Kevin Tree. Historically, the plant has taken leachate also from the Mortown landfill. Um, currently, that's not the case, and I think they've found a, another outlet for that. Um, and so there's no plans to resume leachate receipt from the Mortown landfill. I believe the um, approval for leachate acceptance was um, in the early 2000s. There was a project uh, that included septage and leachate receiving, and um, that was uh, included in our NIPTES permit and um, has been amended with each renewal of the NIPTES permit to allow the city um, to continue acceptance. Um, if I missed something, Linda, uh, let me know. I think that was the questions you had. Yeah, I, well, I just would like to respond that I have been reading up about leachate, and it, by definition, some of it is contained, has contained high organic waste. Um, that's part of the odor issue, part of it. Um, the other issue about leachate was the business manager had informed me that there are other sources of uh, leachate coming into the um, to the plant other than Coventry. So um, if she's incorrect, then she needs to somebody in the business office needs to be corrected about that. Um, yep, uh, there could be small traces amount of um, organic waste in the leachate, but it's really the, the project, the high strength organic waste project was primarily focused on um, on food waste materials, fats, oils, and greases. Um, and I'm not sure you talked to in the business office, but like I said, we used to take um, more town landfill, but that but currently we, we do not, and we do not have plans to resume that. Also add that we, in terms of revenue, we, we categorize septage and leachate uh, as, a, as a revenue line. And so it's possible, and I, I don't, you know, it's possible that septage receipts uh, would be from different sources other than leachate. And um, someone could look at that and say we're getting it from multiple sources. So I guess what I'm hearing is you're not considering leachate as an issue in the um, meeting the violation. Uh, requirements of the um, DEC. Well, well, no, we we do plan to have odor control on the leachate receiving tank, but based on the testing that we've done with our consultant, um, that's very low levels of offensive odors. It's primarily coming from 
um, you know, the high strength organic waste receiving system. And then secondary from the uh, septage processing building, um, this is kind of the second highest source of odors. But we will include treatment, odor treatment on the leachate tank as well. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Linda. Um, before we move on, are there any other questions uh, or comments from members of the public? And then we'll return back to the uh, council. Donna, I saw you raising your hand. I just Here can't we. hear you all the time, Jack. You seem to move. That's all. So okay. I'm just trying to get, listen, everybody's <laughs> a different volume. So I keep adjusting my speaker. Sorry. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I was just going to propose that based on what we've heard tonight, that we um, update our uh, standard that January 1st, 2024, um, we'll accept leachate up to 20 parts per trillion. Um, so just kind of move the date to January 1st. I, you know, I hear Sam that they're, they're working really hard to meet that standard. I want to keep pushing for hitting that standard. Um, we could always come back. And if mm -hmm. there's some tweak that needs to be made, um, we could have that discussion. But um, I think having that timeline, keep try to try to do our part to keep everything on track for as quick a construction and um, and even just, you know, the mixing that could be done with untreated leachate. I want to, I want us to be getting as clean of leachate as possible. So that would be my proposal. Yeah. I'll second it. All right. Any discussion, Tim? Oh, okay. Sorry. So the only question I've got is, so our meeting kind of based on the way we ended up playing with the dates for this one would be, if we have one the week of the holidays, would be... Well, actually, December 20th? No, it would be the second and fourth Wednesdays when we meet, right? Yeah. So then it would be December 27th. Which we so probably we won't have a meeting. One, we make it line up with a meeting, assuming we have a meeting during the holidays. Right. Typically, so following Tim's logic there, it would be the January 10 meeting. We would probably meet on January 3rd for budget, but that's usually a budget meeting the next regular meeting would be january 10. if if you want to line it up with six so months from now, council meeting does that make sense to you to uh, your uh, motion that way to january 10th sure okay all right kurt um i just have a clarifying question on that so the city is currently taking uh, small amounts of leachate approximately one truckload a day um, does that is the intent of the council to allow us to continue um, that level of leachate acceptance or is it the uh, council's intention to suspend all leachate acceptance Lauren go ahead it, it, in my proposal I I was kind of continue business as usual until January. And at that point, we would put in place the 20 part per, tri per trillion standard for PFAS and leachate. And city clerk, is that clear enough to you to have that be the form of a motion? Um, it'd be great if it could be restated, um, especially with what, what Kurt said. I'm not sure how to fold that in. Okay. Um, yeah, just one one more uh, point that we were um, planning to um, move to two loads a day, um, you know, following this meeting. So if um, if we could also clarify if, if we're allowed to go up to that level until January 1st, um, you know, it would help the city's finances. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of, um, you know, expenditures related to the flood. Uh, so every little bit helps, but um, we'll leave it to the council to make that decision. Uh, Tim, I don't favor increasing the amount. If we're eighty-one hundred gallons a day. I assume that's weekdays. That's still one hundred eighty thousand gallons a month of this material that's still rolling right down the Winooski River to Lake Champlain into a lot of people's water supplies. And I think we've got to keep the pressure on to deal with this thing, and I don't want to accept any more of it. Okay, um, Lauren, do you want to try to rephrase? your motion so we can then continue to discuss it. 
So I propose our policy is to allow current levels of leachate acceptance at the water resource recovery facility until January 10th, at which point PFAS levels cannot exceed 20 parts per trillion. Or can we just agree to stop it January 10th, Lauren? We make it a hard stop. Producer. Uh, Laura, Patana, you have your hand up. I, I really like that you stop and we assess it at the time. Uh, and I would second the motion that she stated. Okay, so there's the, the motion is continuing current practices up till January 10th. And um, it's been seconded. Is there any discussion by members of the council? Hey, Linda, I see you have your hand up. Uh, can you get something in in 30 seconds? Yes, I can. One, um, I'm still not clear on when we started accepting leachate again. I know that the council had stopped it. And then I started seeing line items in the budget where it was being accepted again. I'm not clear about that. Number two, the council isn't considering the air quality issues of the leachate. I'm, I understand PFAS is huge and I don't dispute that, but you're also under an order from the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation to deal with the air quality issues. So continuing to accept leachate, leachate is, although it's not the only part of the problem, as Kurt indicated, it is a part of the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, council, are you ready to vote on the motion? If so, all those signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, we'll have a, we required to have a roll call uh, vote. Uh, Bate? Aye. Brown? Aye. Alfano? Sal, you're muted. Aye. Uh, Heaney? No. And hurl. In the aye. car. I'm sorry, uh, you, Lauren, you said uh, aye. Lauren, did we lose you? Can, can you hear me? Yes, OK. OK, sorry. Yeah. Yes, I said aye. OK, uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Um, folks, thanks for uh, for your presentation and uh, members of the public thank you for uh, for all your comments and observations um we're moving next to the uh, item ab about the greenway institute regarding purchase of uh, vermont college of fine arts buildings and and this is on because uh, very recently i <laughs> received uh, uh, texts and emails from uh, Rebecca Holcomb about this project and and they're working on putting together all their financing and they're asking us to sign off on a statement that uh, that the city supports their proposal to move their new uh, to create this new educational program at uh, this uh, VCFA buildings and so uh, I talked to Bill with, about this, and we put it on the agenda for tonight. Um, Bill, do you have anything to add? Okay, so does anyone on the council have any questions or comments? It looks like an excellent opportunity. Yeah, Carrie. Thanks. Um, so just a couple of quick things. Um, there is, Montpelier is misspelled at one point in here. So I think that's really important to correct. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, so when I read through this, I um, I feel like there's a few, you know, in general, it's fine. I'm fine with it. But there are a few statements in here that I, I don't know that I have enough information to really get behind. Um, I, you know, I don't know what the presence of students will actually be. I don't know how many they're talking about. I don't know how long they're going to be here. I don't know if that's really going to bring any meaningful revenue to downtown businesses. Um, maybe. Um, um, I I don't know. I don't have any information at all about 
this program supporting incubation of new businesses that will bring revenues and high quality, higher wage jobs to the region. So I just feel like it's, I'd be fine with saying this can, you know, we're, we don't have, we don't see an er adverse impact. We, we feel like it's consistent with our, our um, strategic goals and we're fine with it. And that's probably all that they need. Right. But um, I also wasn't sure why every other paragraph is italicized and uh, <laughs> Seems like, is there some copying and pasting going on? So it was just a, a little odd there. Yeah, it's true that she she sent me this and she told me it, it doesn't have, there's no magic formula that the that it has to be. And, and I think you're probably right about the cutting and pasting for the italics. And, and I think if, uh, if the motion uh, tracks what you just said, I think that would probably be sufficient to meet their needs. Uh, Donna, um, I, I guess I thought they may be overstated, but indeed, when we had other colleges there, we found students that are facing some staying and starting new businesses. So I didn't think it was totally off, just maybe a little extreme. Mm -hmm. stated. that's all. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on the council have any thoughts? Um, yeah, so uh, I just saw this for the first time. I guess it wasn't. It wasn't there, at least when I accessed the agenda earlier today. Um, I kind of agree that it's it's a little a little overstated. I mean, I, I I know virtually nothing about this program other than the sort of outline that we you know we received. Um, so I, I would I would uh, prefer to have it toned toned down somewhat and um, along the lines of of what Carrie's suggesting. I'll direct a question to the clerk. Um, were the comments of Councillor Brown sufficient to formulate a, a motion that we could uh, vote on? Well, um, they we were specific. Um, I, I, I would say, I guess, yes, a little odd, but, but there, there was enough there that I can, you know, I, I can just essentially transcribe that and it is, you know, cohesive enough to be a motion. Could you okay. just, uh, I'm taking a look at this. Uh, if maybe if you just, if we just deleted everything after, so where it says students bring youth and energy to our community, that seems pretty innocuous. And then everything after that starts sort of getting into specifics, you sort of take everything out after that and leave the rest. I think that's what I heard Council Member Brown saying. Carrie, does that work for you? Yeah, I think that would be fine. With the correct spelling of Montpelier right above there. Yeah. yeah. That, because that that, be that's a real place. It's and it's not here. Right. <laughs> um, is there a second? Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Is there any other uh, discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Thank you. We've adopted uh, that resolution. Now we're up to item number eight, which I suspect is the uh, main thing that people are here to talk about, which is flood and flood recovery updates. And I think we'll start by handing it to you, Bill. So um, I think what we were hoping to do tonight, I was gonna give you a quick update on city infrastructure. And we have most of the key department heads here who could talk about anything in, in uh, more detail. I was gonna quickly go over the frequently asked questions that we published. I'm not gonna read them all, they're, they're lengthy, but at least hit the main topics. And then afterward, uh, if then if there's anything that any of our staff want to add that I, I missed, I'd like them to do that. And then after that, we turn it over to the council to answer any questions or respond to any comments or and the public, of course, uh, that people may have uh, because we know there's there's a lot out there. So if that sounds okay to people, that's how I'll proceed. If you'd like me to do something different, then I could do that. But works works for me. Okay. 
So quickly for city infrastructure, uh, city or just going down building by building, uh, city hall, the cleaning is completed. The, the cleaning company has come out of the building. That's, it's still a long way from being usable, but uh, they've turned it back over to us. So uh, the elevator is still out of, uh, out of uh, whack. The generator still needs to be fixed. Uh, we have to move a bunch of systems out of the basement and up and figure that out. Uh, our, the memorial room and council chambers are still just packed full with boxes and things that moved up from downstairs that didn't get wet, uh, but needed a place to go. Uh, we've got conversations with the teen center about whether it makes sense for them to come back to this space or to seek other space. Uh, and then, of course, we need to start our own decision-making process internally and with you as a council about how we put the puzzle pieces back together. Um, so I know everyone is plenty busy right now, but we'd be happy to walk you through the building, uh, you know, to see the shape that it's in. Uh, downstairs is really just walls and studs, and, um, you know, it's really, it's really a shell of a, a building right now, but it does have a clean floor. Uh, so there's... Bill, with regard to the uh, to City Hall, I believe I heard uh, early on that there was there were mold issues, and I wonder if you can yeah, those have point. been addressed. Um, and you know, they're still I think it's still going to need to air out a little bit longer before we want to have a lot of people in there. Um, one side, the the finance office uh, side, uh, that I think needs some carpeting and some sheetrock put back but that could be functional you know relatively soon maybe uh, assuming the other systems were go uh, but but we're still a long way from uh, really fully reoccupying that building and a lot of decisions left to be made police station is generally functional the elevator is out and they've had some issues with their phones i i think they're corrected but if eric is on he can correct me about that fire station uh the fire department is back using the fire basement but fire there is still uh their first floor uh, not the apparatus room but the offices in the back have been cleaned out so they've they've got to decide about what how to put those back and then there is some structural damage in the back uh, that is starting to collapse uh, and it has to do with their basement access so we've got to figure that out and uh, maybe correct for those of you who've never been out behind the fire station, there's a, an old ramp that goes down to the basement, and that's just a perfect place to funnel water in uh, whenever we have one of these events. So we're thinking maybe there's a way we could correct that access to the basement, as, and, and that's also where the structural failure is. So that's still working. Um, DPW of course, has uh, three pump stations out of four that were underwater and damaged. They are... Uh, in the process of getting those completed. There are road washouts around the city. We just signed a contract today for, if those of you going go up Main Street have seen, um, if you're going up the hill on the left, there's a pretty big sinkhole that we believe is a collapsed sewer pipe and that needs to be completely replaced and fixed uh, to stop that washout. Uh, there's also a big problem with uh, Prospect Street. There's a, a lot, you know, an undermining of the, the hill. So we're trying to take care of that. So those are big projects and some small ones. Uh, the debris clearing, of course, is the biggest effort that they're coordinating. That's pretty visible around town. And um, DPW and through Evelyn are trying to give everybody an update each day of the progress made and where they're going to be the next day. I know we get a lot of questions about, you know, when are they going to be in my neighborhood? And the answer is we, we, we don't know for sure because they're they really see what they can accomplish in one day and then where the next, you know, what the next day's effort it, it would be best spent doing. Um, so they're often just a day ahead of scheduling. So, you know, we know that they're going to get everything done in two to three weeks, but we can't say for sure we're going to this street or that street the next next week yet. Recreation Department, Dog River, Dog River Field was completely flooded and is um, unusable. Uh, so that happened in 2011 as well. Uh, so we're taking a look to see what uh, kind of coverage can be there or whether uh, uh, we could use funds to sort of build a field somewhere else uh, and maybe convert that to different use. Uh, but that is, you know, out, out of commission for this season for sure. 
The rec center has been used uh, for storage of a lot of the facilities that we, a lot of the donations and supplies that we received. It's now going to be converted into use for a disaster uh, recovery center for FEMA for the next 30 days or so. Uh, so uh, that's great that we have that facility. It's great that it's handy to downtown, um, but it does mean that in terms of impact on programs, it's not available for basketball, pickleball, and some of the other rec uses. So uh, Country Club Road site has been used uh, to store new uh, trash containers. People see trash containers up there. We clear those have been newly delivered. They've never had trash in them. They're being used there until they can be deployed somewhere else uh, and those kind of things. Uh, and some of the trucks are staging up there. Uh, and then we are obviously looking at other things. Uh, finance, planning, clerk, Montpelier Alive, and Justice Center are all functioning at the senior center on the second floor, uh, or Justice Center, in their case, the first floor. And until we figure out what we're going to do with City Hall and how to bring them back, that transition has now been completed and is functional. That does, however, leave the city senior center with two uh, activity rooms that they've traditionally used that are now taken up with offices. So there's a negative impact on the senior center. Uh, we are looking to see if we can move some of their activities to the Elks, former Elks Club building, at least temporarily, uh, until we get the until we get the offices back in the city hall. And lastly, the hub, uh, the lack of better name, the hub section there uh, with all the tents in Montpelier Alive, uh, or the volunteer hub, is winding down, um, you know, the, the intense activity is, you know, there's no more uh, food happening there. Uh, Alice French Fries is closing up as of today. This was their last day of serving. Um, you know, the big rush of volunteers is over there, still doing the volunteer management and pairing. So if you are a building owner or a business owner and you need help, please ask. They still have the list of volunteers uh, and they'll will still be managing that, but there will not be as much of a presence after this week at that 12 to 16 Main Street site. FEMA has had um, people sitting there this week and have had a lot of business of people just walking up. That was a request of ours that they do that. And they they have done that now. As I said, they're going to be setting up their recovery center at the rec center. So they will have a, a place. So um, that's kind of the status of city infrastructure right now. We, you know, just on our own, we've got plenty going on. Um, if there's anybody from the city staff uh, that wants to add that I'm something I missed, I'd welcome that. No? Okay. I'm not seeing any hands going up. Yeah. Okay. Good. Star. Council members, do you have any questions on this part of the presentation before we move on? Carrie. Yeah, thank you for all that. Um, so I know that uh, the city has been, I know you've been devoting every every moment of your time and your energy and your thoughts to all of this. And I really appreciate it. And I know how complex it is. And I know that it's going to keep going for a long time. Um, and so as we're thinking about the future of operations within the city hall building itself, um, we've I know there's been kind of some thoughts tossed around about trying to get everything possible out of the basement and just thinking in terms of when this happens again, because it's going to happen again. And so we need to be going forward. We need to be thinking always in terms of what happens the next time we get a flood like this, or maybe even a worse one. And so I know it's very early and you don't have plans yet, but can you just share some of the, the discussions, the thinking, the possibilities that you're tossing around for the future of that building and how it will be used? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, I think you're right. I mean, that's exactly been the, the top thing is what, you know, what question do we not want to answer next time that we, you know, we could have done this time. And uh, so I think the number one thing is looking at all of our systems that need to come up, uh, even the elevator, mechanicals, everything uh, that we can get up onto the first floor and out of the basement as possible. And, and then what, might be left the boilers and things like that how we can harden and protect them even you know better than we have knowing that that's imperfect but um and so then so i think this the general assumption without without uh, having done any design is that the best place for all those mechanicals would be you know in the back of what we call the memorial room now you know so that room 
it, you know, there's an already closet there that has all our computer equipment, which was moved up um, to avoid this situation. So thank goodness for that. Uh, but, you know, I can almost picture like that front going all the way across the back of that room with all of our other mechanical stuff in the back of there, which then makes the council chamber memorial room much smaller. Uh, and I think the next consideration would be to probably convert that to offices so that we have no offices downstairs. Um, and um, so with computers, desks, personal materials, files, all, you know, those kind of important things that, that we lost. Um, and, you know, probably having some form of, you know, meeting spaces, community spaces, those kind of things in the basement. If you go through it now with the walls down, it's a pretty large space. Uh, so, you know, I think part of it is what, what, and do we put the offices back where they came from or do we, you know, is there a way to make our functions more efficient as we, as everybody's out, if we move everybody back into a different place, maybe there's a better way to do it. But, um, but I think, uh, you know, I, I think our general thinking is not to have anything of huge value in the basement. Meeting space is important, of course, generally day in, day out. And, you know, it might be that we would lose some, you know, thinking about the current council chamber. I mean, most of the cameras and things are up high, uh, but maybe the, you know, it might be the console that runs a, a video system, maybe a TV, you know, there, there would be things that could get lost, but they might be in the tens of thousands and not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, you know, a meeting table and some chairs uh, versus the kind of actual operational losses that we suffered this time. And especially with, you know, the ability to run things virtually, we have, it's not ideal, but we have a backup, you know, option. So we're really at the front end of this, but that's, that is what we're thinking. And, and I think we probably will seek some, you know, architectural help or something to think about programming and what's needed. And then obviously engage the city council. This is your building is community's building into what, what needs to be there. And obviously we need to have a functioning elevator but it needs to have its, you know, part of the reason it's not functioning now is its mechanical system got flooded. And that mechanical system can be on any floor. So why keep it in the basement? Just because that's where it always was. So um, those are the kind of things. And the generator, same same thing. So, uh, Lauren. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, throw out an uh, idea that I've been thinking about and really coming out of a lot of conversations that I've been having with residents and business owners and a lot of people just spending a lot of time thinking about, you know, what are we doing right now to develop plans and make sure that we're making our community more resilient to floods and our changing climate. Um, you know, I think tonight is a great opportunity to start getting feedback. Um, I am hoping we could create a space um, for the community to come together, um, ideally with an outside facilitator who could help um, really start a, a process and a conversation in the community. You know, we've been seeing a lot of ideas, a lot of, you know, how do we build ourselves in a different way and make sure that we're not just rebuilding. You know, we've got, we're talking about city hall right now, but you know, all the businesses and all the homeowners who are impacted too, you know, how can we be together working to, to create um, a more resilient community um, knowing that there will be more floods. And so I'm really interested in um, exploring a community conversation with an outside facilitator. I've talked to um, some amazing folks. We have such resources in our community who um, have real expertise in convening this kind of conversation. And there's, I think, a, a willingness and eagerness and generosity to, to partner with us on this. Um, and so I'm very interested in exploring this and just wanted to um, get councils, um, kind of feedback on if that kind of initial meeting and potentially leading to a bigger community conversation and process to look at, you know, real strategies that can be actionable for flood resilience, um, just if there's interest. And if so, I'm very happy to spearhead some work and bringing some people together to think that through more, but just wanted to throw it out. Well, I'll jump in first and just say, yes, I think this is a great idea. I think it's great that you have come up with this, Lauren. I think that, uh, Lord knows in the next uh, six months, we'll have plenty of work to do as a council that uh, 
if we could also have outside professional facilitators uh, who have uh, who are experienced and uh, and respected in the community, I think that would be uh, a tremendous uh, benefit to the city. And I see some other heads nodding. If one of any other council members have any comments to make. Yeah, Lauren, or sorry, sorry, Donna. It's okay. You, you call them, oh, however. You're up, okay. you're up, Donna. I just wanted to second that, and I would hope that we can really ask for volunteers. We have a lot of professionals in our community. I mean, we are cash, cash short. And so I think it's very appropriate that we can, we could ask more than many people in our community who might help facilitate the small groups as well as the large. I mean, there might be ways to do this whether it's online or in person, depending on what kind of spaces we can find in the future. Mm -hmm. Tim. Tim, you did have your hand up a minute ago. Did you put it down or? I was just gonna say, I agree with Lauren. I think it's a great idea. I think we, it's truly master planning that we need to look ahead. And, um, you know, and even with city hall, I think we just have to have a very open view about how that building will be used in the future. Um, and I know we've got some neat things going there, but there's also a lot of great space upstairs. And, and I think we've got to look openly at how we can use it. Um, maybe city council meetings go upstairs too. I mean, it... and, um, Sal. Uh, yes, I, I, I agree as well. I, I think um, I, I, I welcome the, the, the idea of getting the getting the community together to come up with a um, with with a hopefully a long list of potential solutions to explore um, for both short term but also for long term. I mean, I I agree that I I mean I, I can't possibly predict, uh, uh, but I, I can't imagine that this won't won't happen again. And I don't think that that's acceptable. Frankly, I think we should push for a solution that makes it as unlikely as possible, much as they must have done after 1927, um, which helped us a lot uh, 100 years later. Um, so I, I don't know if, if it can be done in the same process, but I think we ought to plan not only for the kind of solution that would, um, would help with things like the, the changes we've made in um, the, wizard ha uh, the river hazard area and so on, but also um, large scale uh, projects that, that might actually make this um, more unlikely than likely in the future. Thanks, uh, Sal. Carrie. Yeah, I also think this is a great idea. Um, I, uh, I, I like the idea of kind of ha starting off with a, a chance for people to think kind of in the short term because there were you know, lots of questions and uh, I'm sure lots of people have ideas for things that could have been done a little bit differently that like some, there was some information that could have come from the state that didn't come from the state or um, didn't come quickly enough, things like that, that I think would be really helpful for us as a city to compile and give that feedback and say, this is what would be helpful for the next time this kind of thing happens. But then also that ongoing much longer term discussion about resiliency and about how we um you know if we could turn back time and tell the people who first started building along the river in montpelier if we could tell them maybe you want to move back a little bit and not build right by the river but we can't do that so and we're not going to move downtown montpelier somewhere else so then what can we do though rather than just um hoping it doesn't happen again or scrambling around again the next time so so I, I love this idea thank you lauren for for bringing it up and i'm happy to support in whatever way i can okay thanks bill i know we kind of interrupted in the middle of your presentation but i also see some uh, some community members hands up and so i'll start calling on them because i think they're probably interested in this topic too starting with linda young hi i'm linda young i live over on winter street and i have a question about the debris pickup um and this is not an indictment in any way, just a genuine question. Um, I went over to Barry last Wednesday to support their farmer's market and was stunned by how clean the downtown looked. 
<laughs> drove right down Main Street. There was one dumpster, and otherwise everything was just completely clean, which was a stark contrast, obviously, to what we were looking at. Um, so I'm just curious, what, what, how did we end up in that position? Was it just a difference in degree in what we were experiencing in our downtown, or um, a difference in or what our contractors were able to do? I think it would be helpful to just know how that sure. happened. That, I've been asked that question a lot, and um, I went over to Barry myself and checked it out. Um, Barry's downtown didn't get flooded, really, at all. There was a little bit of water in some basements. The massive amount of flooding that happened, if you're familiar, you know, with sort of Mr. Z's down toward the Salvation Army, that area, that's where all their flooding is. And there, they just began their debris removal uh, yesterday. Um, so they're actually about a week and a half behind us on that. Um, that's where all their debris is. That, that, so you're right, you go through their core downtown and you think, how, how did they get so clean so fast? Um, they didn't have the mess that we had with the basement type thing. So they, they had massive flooding. They've had a lot of home losses. Uh, they've got a ton of debris, but it's in a different part of town and to, you know, in a, of a different nature. Thanks, Bill. Um, Karen Goldwyn, Goldwyn, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, it's Sharon, but thank you. Uh, first, I just want to, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Montpelier resident for 36 years and um, uh, and um, retired about a year and a half ago from the Vermont Department of Health. I was the director of operations, the head of the continuity of operations planning, and of course, a role with uh, whenever Vermont emergency management was opened. Uh, I, I want to say that congratulations to uh, the city manager, to Bill, and to the uh, mayor and, and council. This was a Herculean task you had to take on very quickly. And coming from one event that might have happened several years ago is not going to be the same event moving forward. But um, I, I was wondering a couple of things. Uh, and I would first like to look at the um, um, the uh, continuity of oper operations plan of the city, not not physically look at it. Um, because there was some conflicting information that came out. You know, there was so many emails or uh, uh, from porch forum and then uh, other emails that were coming out. And there was one I recalled that came out that said that the um, city management was looking at where they're moving their, their various departments to, which uh, kind of struck me as, is there a strong enough continuity of operations plan. That type of plan is obviously a little bit different than what you've just been talking about, about bringing the community in. Uh, the continuity of operations plan is where are your three locations that you are have pre-wired, that's your incident command structure, and that you're working out of so that you get there quickly and you can begin business of running the city while dealing with the event. You might have that. I don't know that. Yeah, um, so I, yeah, if I may respond to that, because sure. so we do have a continuity of operations plan and we actually executed it. Um, you know, I think that we, I don't know, I, we haven't responded to every comment that's been made just because you can't, um, sure. but we actually trained on this exact transition a few years ago where we moved our operations to the senior center, uh, yeah, which is where we've moved them to. Uh, the only difference was at that point we had trained on a, like if it was a temporary one day type jump as opposed sure. to a permanent fix. Uh, so that was what we had to, that was the difference. So we were, we knew where we were going and we were able to do so pretty quickly. Um, it was just getting things like copiers and things like that that were destroyed that right. had to come, and we, we wouldn't preload those uh, phone systems. And the other major continuity of operations was moving our operations center up to the water treatment plant because we had always anticipated that the biggest disaster we would probably deal with would be flooding and it would have packed the middle of our, our town. And, you know, as I think I said before, we actually moved our dispatch center at four in the morning from uh, its downtown location to the water treatment plant along with Barry's because their plan was to come in with us, which they did. 
uh, and we did that without missing a single uh, E911 call. Uh, so all of those plans were in place and, and executed and um, had been practiced, although it, uh, I, it's funny now, it wasn't funny that night, uh, but we had just been talking about actually in August um, doing another run of practicing them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and so you we, know, got, I, we got a good. We got a good. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, good, I, good I agree. You've always got it. You've got to, got to always exercise the plan. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but I, I'm, I just, I'm glad. You know, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that that there was because some of the information coming out, it did it yeah. seemed a little bit um, off off, um, but I'm glad there is a plan. I I would just suggest you look at a one day, a one week a two week and then beyond. Thanks, Donna. Um, and Sharon, that's a, there's a signal of one minute left. So let's let's let Bill sure. finish answering the question. The the only other last thing I'd want to say is the Vermont College buildings, I think we have some opportunities as things uh, arrive to the city that is there a way to negotiate use of those properties in the event of emergency, whatever who becomes the new owners, if that wasn't done yet. Okay, thank you. Bill, did you have anything you needed to add to, the, to what you've already told us? I think it was a pretty complete answer. No, and I only, no, I think I've covered it except to say that we, you know, we have been in contact with Vermont College uh, throughout this disaster about possibilities. And, you know, they're in a funny situation because they're about to sell. Uh, so there's, I, I think uh, we, we have already had outreach from the new potential new owners and we hope that we can work out um, again, it's that kind of contingency planning with them. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Alyssa Sharon. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak in support of Lauren's idea. Um, thank you for bringing that up. I would be great to be able to do that even sooner than later, if possible. Um, I think it would be really good to re-envision together what this could look like. I've been working with um, Christ Episcopal Church, which has really flooded, and we're in active conversations last night about do we raise up the flooring right now, and we have people coming in to do that, and you're just wondering, like, it, you know, there's all these questions about where the resources could come in for things like that, too, and I know that FEMA has some grants, you know, perhaps that we could access as a city through the public administration program or the flood mitigation assistance program that they were talking to me about when I was meeting with them the other day. And so I know we're making a lot of choices. I'm sure, Tim, you must be thinking about like, well, what resources, if I did these mitigations in some of my buildings, could I get back and reimbursed for? Um, because some of that you can. And so perhaps also having someone from FEMA or you know, the SBA program on site to answer questions that might come up during a conversation like that could be really helpful. Um, also, I would um, thank you so much for all the work folks have been doing in the city. It's it's amazing, you know, Herculean, really. Um, so thank you for everything that you're doing. And I would love to hear what grants you are thinking about applying for. I know that is like a second phase. You know, when I was meeting with FEMA recently, they said, we're doing the individual phase the business phase through the SBA loan. And then we're gonna have these experts on site that are, can talk about the the grants that we're, are going to be helping on the resilience side and that maybe those folks would be more based in Waterbury than in the Montpelier Berlin area. But I'd just love to hear from the city on like what you're thinking about applying for and how we could be considering this in a revisioning um, conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Thanks Alyssa. Um, so I, I don't, Mike. So I would say we're trying to understand what's available first of all, uh, and, and also there we we, uh, you know, like a lot of operations, we're dividing and conquering. So uh, obviously, we're trying to get our own city operations and the general community put back together, and provide that kind of logistic support on the ground, and making sure that we're tracking everything we're doing so that we can be you know reimbursed for every nickel we can get back from FEMA. Mike and his department, Mike Miller Planning Department are already starting to think about the long-term funding and grants and opportunities. And I think, you know, I just wanted to add, by the way, that um, from staff perspective, we were 100% on board with the, the proposal of Lauren. I think it'd be great to have a community conversation about, it. you know, if we're gonna, if we have big changes, people need to be on board with them. So rather than have 
the city manager and the city council force something down people's throats. I think having having a, a big buy-in about how we go in the future and if we're going to invest local resources, what that looks like. So all, all in on that. And I, um, so, Mike, do you want to weigh in on funding what we know right now? Yeah, I guess the best I can say at this point, Josh Jerome has been um, doing most of the homework on this. There are there are some because we have a hazard mitigation plan. There's some hazard hazard mitigation funds that can also help. Uh, there's uh, there's what we call brick funding. There is FMA funding. So we're looking at a whole bunch of options, and we have a planning meeting scheduled for tomorrow with staff to kind of start laying out you know you know needs in one column and the grant opportunities in another so we can start understanding where we should direct our efforts first because you know, we obviously can't apply for five different grants all at the same time we're going to have to pick which is which is the one that's going to have the best bang for the buck and and make that proposal make that pitch to bill and to you guys that we recommend x then y then z um and and kind of get our education done and then try to get you guys educated on what the options are. Um, but we do recognize FEMA has a limited amount of uh, options for direct assistance and most of the rebuilding going forward, if there's going to be financial assistance, is going to probably be passed through funds through the planning office. Um, and so we've got, um, you know, we're, we have two buckets. We're working on a We've got our regulatory requirements. We're trying to make sure we get the message out on what the requirements are that people have to meet for our flood hazard rules. And then we've got our program side. You know, you have to do this and how can we help you do it? So we kind of have two hats going at once right now. Um, thank one you for that. One thing I wanted to add too, which might help Alyssa is that I, I forgot to put this in my overviews. We're also working on uh, engaging a FEMA consultant, you know, people that specialize in navigating the way through FEMA. Uh, right, the state has a person, a, a company on contract, and we're looking. We think we can purchase them through that state contract without having to go through. But there are others, so we have people that speak the language and know what they're doing, and that is reimbursable. So, I meant to put that in my first statements. That's really smart. I think, um, you know, I feel like after one one hour conversation, I have just enough information to be dangerous and probably not fully accurate. And so having folks on hand who are much more expert on this is really would be great. And I guess just one thing that I took away from the conversation and just any business owners might also have as a takeaway is that some of these rebuilding, if you do rebuild in a more resilient way, there is the possibility that you can get reimbursed for that later through some of the city funding should you get those types of grants. I know a bunch of that's up in the air, but that was very, so obviously we all need to be keeping our receipts and you know making the decisions, but there is some incentive to not just build back in the same way, it seems to me. Do you think that's fair to say? Was, was that a yes, Bill? Oh, like I, said, I, said, I, said, I hope so. I think, you know, I think my personal view, and this isn't necessarily, you know, I, I don't, I can't, I don't have enough knowledge about what FEMA offers, but I feel like we as a community need to um, figure out what is the right way to rebuild. And we need to figure out with, along with the state, how to provide the resources for people to do that. You know, I think it's got to be more than just, you got to do this, I think, because there's winners and losers, no matter, you know, I mean, winners and losers, maybe not the right way to put it. But for example, the, the dams that saved us, you know, there are properties upstream that got flooded because of those dams, right? So um, for every action you have, somebody's paying a price for it. And, you know, way back when people lost their homes in order to build those dams. So um, I think as we think about, yes, we want a resilient community. So Say, for instance, we want to fill in basements and raise things up. You know, building owners and business owners are going to bear those costs and, um, you know, maybe lose. You know, I'm looking at City Hall. We're going to move all these things upstairs. Great. We're going to lose a whole bunch of space in one of our buildings. Well, that's great. We're not leasing it by the square foot. But if you are, that's an issue. So how do you assist people with doing that in a way that's, you know, helping our community sustain itself in the long run and still making the right decisions? And I think... That's where our community, you know, conversation needs to happen to get to a place where everyone, you know, there's not sort of one side pointing, one group of people point to another group saying, here, you fix it. 
Tim, Tim, it looked like you had a uh, response specifically to something Mike was saying. So I'm going to call on you now. Yeah, I'm struggling with the 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 two directions of the conversation. One is this, you know, planning for resiliency, you know, looking forward, really giving it deliberate thought and trying to create positive results and support property owners uh, to improve properties to make them safer and have better longevity for the future. And then I look at the communications coming out from the city right now and, and from Mike's office, and it's really kind of heavy handed. Um, it's causing a lot of people a lot of stress and anxiety. And it just doesn't feel right to me because you're, you're presenting things or we're presenting things as the city government as if they're edicts and you have to move everything up right now. We're in the middle of a crisis. People are spending huge amounts of their money and resources just to try to stabilize. Um, these systems that need to be moved up, electrical systems, heating systems, all that, we're working on it. It takes time and a lot of money, and it needs to be done deliberatively, not knee-jerk right now when we're in the middle of a crisis. And, and I think these communications, I have friends who are really stressing because they just need to fix a furnace, and their heating person shows up and says, gosh, the city's saying we have to move it upstairs. Um, is that true? So uh, the answer is, is yes. That's why we have the, we're talking about temporary and permanent fixes. In some cases, we have people who are making permanent changes and they only want to spend the money once. So they're like, I've got a limited amount of money. I don't want to spend something to make a temporary fix. So that way next year I have to make a permanent fix. I would rather make the permanent fix now. So what we're trying to do is to get the word out that the the answer is all uh, all of these temporary fixes the permanent fix is the utilities and when we say utilities we're referring to like your electric panels your furnace um tying down tanks so if you if you had a tank whether it's propane or an oil tank that got dislodged that's going to require an engineer certificate these are just some of the the major things that have occurred that people are going to need to be aware of. So they don't make a quick fix and spend some money and then have to redo and lose some money. And in some cases, the answer is I got to do a temporary fix now. You know, I'll have to spend $500 now to spend $1,000 later because I don't just am not ready to make that $1,000 now. But or the me, flood hazard me. rules, the, the flood hazard rules are very, they're, they're very strict and they've come down um, because so many people in so many communities, this isn't this isn't um, directed at anyone in Montpelier. This is nationally. So many communities simply go through and say, "I got to get back on my feet. I'm just going to fix things," and then they never get around to making those other repairs and moving those things up. Um, and then by the time these programs come, it's it's not available. That's why FEMA has been continuing to tighten the regulatory rules to try to get more and more of these things moved up at the time that they happen. Um, and so that's why, you know, we're in a tough spot. We're trying to work with people to let them know, make the temporary repairs. We don't want anyone losing their house because they don't have electricity. Fix the panel, get the electricity. Um, we're trying to get in touch with the hardest hit because those are the ones who really have some hard decisions to make. Um, but the people who have water in their basement and need to work on, on moving those up, eventually, um, you know, the state has told us, uh, you know, temporary should be about six months. Our office is saying there's no way that would ever happen. So we're already looking at what's probably going to be one to two years. And it may be like a one year with a renewable automatically to two years because we've got to we've got to still follow the NFIP rules. So we're, we're trying to walk a line between what. NFIP is telling us we have to do and how we can kind of get there in the right amount of time. So we're trying to walk a line and that's what we're trying to do. But we want people to know eventually things have to get moved up if there are unique cases and we know there are going to be unique cases. Um, we're going to have to have we have a process and we're going to have to go through that process with individual homeowners um, people have already told us, hey, if you've got a, if you're a big commercial building, if you've got a steam boiler in your basement, you can't elevate that. It operates on gravity. There's no way to move that. And we've got to work with you. Um, and we work with people different times, different ways. Uh, the sewer plant had a flood issue um, two years ago. We got a waiver for them. 
because their pumps were going to be below flood stage, but they have to be below flood stage. So FEMA, we worked through the state and they approved it. They just, um, Kurt and the people at the water plant, they actually have extra, or the sewer plant, they actually have extra pumps on site. So they're allowed to keep this stuff below floodplain, even though you normally wouldn't. So we work with people to come up with a solution. But if you can meet the rules, we can issue the permit. You come in, you apply, we issue the permit and in 24 to 48 hours, you've got your permit, you're ready to go. If you need special considerations, we need more time to work with the state about whether that special consideration is okay under NFIP or not. A couple things just to reply. Um, NFIP, for people who don't know, is National Flood Insurance Program. And basically, um, so these are federal government agencies' rules that are coming down. They're not monthly ordinances, they're not state laws, not even federal laws, they're an agency's rules. Um, that they seem to be imposing. The message from the city right now that I'm seeing, Mike, still is you have to change them, you have to move them up. It doesn't clearly tell people they have an option for a short-term fix. Uh, maybe I'm missing something, but what I've been reading is pretty strong. And that's really causing some tough reactions in the community. I think the reality of doing this work, um, we've already started investigating it. We had been in some cases before this flood. And what it's gonna take to get the, the permits, I've been told right now for one building we've got that if the electrician submits the permit, the state will maybe get to it within a month. Um, from then on, the electricians have to order the hardware, which is not readily available. So yeah, you were right that the six month timeline is absolute dreamland. Um, it, it just, it needs, a, it needs a lot of thought and a lot of work. And I think we have to help people through this right now. Um, our approach with making people go in and get permits for everything they're doing to keep their buildings running is just, Oh, it's punitive. And I got to tell you, I don't have time for it. I, I'm dealing with insurance adjusters and contractors, and I still have to make a living too. Um, and, and to add city permits to that list just feels really bad to me. I don't think it's the right way to go. Well, the, the permits, the city permits have no fees. I, I don't know if you were at the last council. I don't know if you were there at the last council meeting, uh, but the council has right. waived the fees. So there are no city fees other than a recording fee. Yeah. Um, that's the only fee that you'll pay um, for any so of the old ones. Well, we recognize it takes a lot of time, Tim. It does. Okay, I see a couple of other council members' hands up that I want to get to, Carrie and then Sal. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so as we were sitting down to this meeting here in our dining room, our neighbors came and knocked on the door. And they said... We heard that everyone's going to be required in the entire city to move their furnace up out of their basement. Is that true? And I said, I haven't heard anything about that. So now I'm wondering, did I steer my neighbors astray? And I have not gotten the communication that Tim has gotten. So this is all new to me. And um, we, need, we need some clarification. And people have already made repairs. So it's not a matter of um deciding whether you're going to make the long-term repair or the short-term repair people have already made repairs and haven't had a chance to even do that assessment of do i want to do the short term or the long term because they haven't heard anything about what the requirements are so we need we need some clarification it needs to go out to everybody absolutely immediately i know we've been we've been working with um, and unfortunately, the, the nature of this has been that there's been a lot of these public notices. Um, but I know Evelyn has been doing and putting out a number of notices on this. We were just talking today about getting another one back out um, on a more regular basis so we can keep reminding people because a lot of people have had their heads down just working on stuff and we got to keep getting the message out. And that was a conversation we had with Evelyn today. So um, I get that. So there there are distinctions. And I will say this for anyone here, and if you if you have anyone and they have any questions, emailing Audra Brown, a brown at montpelier-vt.org. Um, not everything, and this is why it makes it so hard to try to condense something, and then it's complicated. So if anyone has questions, if you email Audra, she will get back to you in writing with the with the response. And the best part of that is, is that you have evidence of what was said and they and we have evidence of what was said and, and it works well. If somebody is repairing something, there's a distinction between repair and replace. 
if you're repairing something, it does not need to be elevated. If it's replaced, it does. So a lot of what we've been telling people is, you know, if you're going to do a temporary repair, go ahead and do it. That's that's not going to be uh, as as big of an uh, of of an issue. But if you're going to, if somebody has come in to say that furnace has got to go and we've got to put a new furnace in, the new furnace has to be elevated to the next floor. Um, and uh, you know, the electrical panels, you know, there's only so many electricians, electrical panels have to get moved up. That's really, that's the number one safety issue. Um, the big issue about the furnaces is, is losing it. If we get a ice jam, electric panels, people can die from electric panels underwater. So that's our big one. We want to make sure we get the electric panels up. We want to make sure we get those furnaces moved up. So that way, if we've got flooded in, in January because of an ice jam, um, there are 375 buildings in the floodplain. Um, if if it's a hundred year flood event, which is about what we had, there's 375 buildings, um, and that's a lot of a lot of stuff that has to get fixed, and a lot of um, potential damage if this happens in the winter. Thanks, uh, Sal. Then Donna, and then I want to get back to members of the public. Uh, I just wanted to to say that I I agree with both Mike and Tim. I think. Like, for example, that distinction you just made, Mike, about repair versus replace is in the language, but it isn't really clear to people, I don't think. I think you need to call things like that out. I think a lot of people don't know where the river hazard area is. They need a map. And I think uh, they are unclear about what FEMA will and will not reimburse, whether they'll reimburse a short-term fix and then also uh, like if you fix your electrical panel today to get get it up and running, and then you move it upstairs six months from now, are they uh, paying for one and not the other? How, how does it work? So there are a lot of questions like that. Yeah, and I, I won't be able to help with any of the FEMA stuff. Um, the what they reimburse and what because um, there there are many avenues of getting FEMA assistance. Um, if you have insurance, then you're going to have to follow what the insurance rules are. If you've got um, the, the individual assistance, then that's going to be a different set of rules. And um, I, I just am not familiar enough with those rules. That is always always something I'll direct people. Talk to FEMA if you need FEMA advice. If you have permit advice, um, absolutely email our, our office. Um, it's, it's what we do. It doesn't cost anything to ask us a question. So it's just time, I just want to interject here too. We actually did put in a formal request uh, to have FEMA representatives at this meeting tonight, uh, and they were not able to do so because there's a statewide meeting with the congressional delegation on Zoom and the governor, and so they are on that. But they they did say perhaps at a future some future forum they could participate. But we we knew we would not be able to answer FEMA questions, and we wanted to have someone here. Um, so it wasn't for lack of trying. Donna. Well, I have sort of three points. One is, Bill, is there any staff available to help people with the FEMA process? It is overwhelming and very intimidating. And so I don't know if, if they're going to have people here or if we can have some staff to help people. Because they say, you know, they say register, but then you've got to do all the stuff online. And it's, and I feel I've heard from people being confused. So just to ask if that's possible. Um, <laughs> the problem is that we don't understand it really a lot better than either. Else. So, so I, uh, you know, we've been trying not to give people bad advice um, and and you know speak for FEMA because you know people will then say, well, you know, Bill Fraser or Mike Miller or Kelly Murphy told me this and that didn't work. Um, so yeah. we're trying to steer them to the right people. So, having said that, you know, we did ask for FEMA representatives to be at the the hub and they have been this week and there's been a steady stream of people talking to them. I don't know how that's going. They are opening their disaster recovery center for at least 30 days at the rec center, which that's what it's for is to provide, you know, an on the ground resource for people as opposed to just going online. You know, I think the first wave of people was going door to door trying to assess what the damage was and have initial conversations. So again, I'm not trying to apologize or speak for FEMA, but I do know that they are, bringing more resources into the community to try to work with people. And that's probably and, and, 
we, I did get an email saying FEMA was going to be at the tent this week, and I did remind people that have been in touch with me to go. Uh, it's good to hear that they're also going to be at the rec center for the next 30 days. Um, my other question was dealing with uh, DPW. I've gotten so many gold, and I'll go to Mike's. Um, somewhere I read that you could do repairs and get your permit after the fact. But you didn't mention that. Is that still true for a repair, not a replacement? Yeah, I mean, we're we're kind of getting out of the emergency phase at this point. So we're trying to encourage people at this point. Um, during the emergency phase, we didn't want anybody saying, you know, be concerned about saying, oh, my gosh, maybe I shouldn't have the electrician fix my electricity. I'm just going to have to move into a hotel until I can get my permits. We want people to say, no, if you need to get electricity back in your house, you get electricity back in your house and we will deal with your permits later. Um, okay. And do do your temporary fixes, but at the same time, we were trying to get this information out, and apparently, not not clear enough, or and and maybe a little too forceful about making sure people knew. Eventually, these things got to go up, go get elevated. Um, right, and that's, no. that's just one of the requirements, and um, so yeah, we're, gonna, so we got, for, we're trying to do a better they, job with our communications yeah. going forward. We will. Yeah. Uh, luckily, I understood that piece between repair and replacement, but. It is, I mean, I think we're just overwhelmed. So thank you for keep making it clear, clarifications. And it, now, and it was tough. I, it was tough not having an office for, you know, we lost, yeah. for people who didn't know, we, we had 41 inches in the planning office. And so we lost, uh, I had a computer uh, and I think one other person had a computer, but we had no phones, no desks, no pens, papers, no phones um, and two computers. And we didn't really get set up for about seven days for, most of the time, we would have been right out right away to try to, to to get the word out, but we were kind of playing a little bit from behind for a bit, and uh, it it didn't help when we rushed the messaging. It it got a little maybe got a little too uh, didn't didn't take the the time necessary to make sure we had vetted that to make sure it had the right intent. Um, yeah. Well, so you can just keep putting it out and and, and a little softer. That's good. Now, this may be DPW. Uh, there's a lovely chart that came with one of the DPW newsletters about separating your debris. And it talks about appliances and then electronics and then household hazard. So they have literally, like when I was helping with some people with the boomer, they had to move their stuff from underneath the trees. Um, then we brought down the paints. But when I read this chart, it would say appliances are coming next. So that's another schedule of the boomer going around and just doing appliances. And then another time they'll go around and just do elect electronics and then hazardous. Is that how it's going to flow? Um, I'll defer to DPW. I, I'm not sure they're going to be using the big, the big rigs for those things. I think they're, you know, for example, uh, We've done a lot of separation and we have been collecting a lot of that next to City Hall. There's been a huge amount of paint cans and saw Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District to there loading all the paint stuff and taking those away. So that was separate than um, the, the big company that's doing the debris removal. So I think there's several, but uh, if, if DPW wants to actually say something that they know, that'd be even better. Uh -huh. Um, my understanding is that the appliances will be picked up separately. Um, I think like Bill said, the, um, the smaller items won't, likely won't be, you know, done by the large truck. There, are, there's going to be, um, kind of a cleanup sweep. There's areas where there's very small amount of trash sort of like out on the outskirts of town, um, along the North branch was a property out near Gould Hill that had some minor flooding. So I think for the smaller items, it will be a different, uh, type of pickup. Um, but I do believe they will be doing a separate run for the, uh, they call it white goods, which is the appliances. You know, we have these small streets. I think of the one that goes by Monte or Inn. Like they took a lot of their wood and debris and they put it out by the side of that little street uh, that's off of Main Street that's sort of their driveway, but actually I think has a street name or did. Uh, wasn't it Brown Street at one point? It's actually a private street, Brown Street. It's private. Uh, okay, well, now their stuff or is Baird there. Street. Brown so, Street is, is not private. Baird Street is a private street. That's the one you're talking okay. about. Okay, uh, Baird Street. Thank you. So I don't know that, I mean, if the boomer is going to go there 
Are they going to hit some of those little side streets? I'm just a little worried they'll get missed. Yeah. No. So um, in the areas that are too tight for the, the boom truck, um, DPW is actually moving the debris out closer to the right away oh, wow. on the bigger street where we where they can access it. So we will get it. It's just uh, it might take a second move. Okay. Just I just I got they asked me and so I just wanted to check. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Yep. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, Donna. I'd like to move back to members of the public who have their hands up and I see Connor Kennedy first. Thanks, Jack. Uh, sorry, I'm having internet issues, so I can't have my camera. Um, I was wearing my hat coming into this as a resident, but wearing my other day job hat, uh, working in the legislature, I think everyone on the call should know that we know there's a lack of resources for communities across Vermont, and we are working to make sure that there are individuals that can support, um, come in and support towns, municipalities, and cities to navigate a lot of these tricky challenges. Um, the one I showed up tonight for is, I'm just curious about the housing thing. I know Sharon brought it up earlier and wondering why the state college or the VHFA has taken so long. I think many of us might have seen the article yesterday that there are 300 to 400 displaced people out of Barrie and then within our own city we're going to see people that were fine um, on second or third floors but there needs to be work done and so they need a place to go for you know a week two weeks or a month and if we've had any thoughts and what else we as a community can do to like sort of bang that door to make sure that this dorm that has 150 beds can be available for folks. Um, Bill, do we have, uh, yeah. I'd refer that question to Vermont College and let them respond to that. There, there is space there. Um, I think I understand there's been some conversations and I'm not sure what their position is at the moment. I think it's a very good point, Connor. Um, Stan Brinkerhoff. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Stan Brinkerhoff, Main Street. Um, Mike, I, I had spoken with your office early on when some of that news you know, first came out around lifting utilities. Um, and also, you know, spent two weeks in homes, cleaning basements, ripping out walls, uh, and, and spoke with a number of HVAC folk and electrical electricians who who really had no knowledge uh, that they even needed permits in some cases. Uh, they, they considered their work to be, you know, repair work, even if a panel was being replaced. Um, and I, I have seen the press release, you know, thank you for, for putting that out. I saw it in the bridge. I saw it in, in some emails. And I, I think I read it differently than maybe Tim did. Um, but also Tim was on some of my early emails when there was a, a bunch of confusion. Um, it, it does seem like now is the time we, you know, we have a list of addresses that were impacted. You know, my player live has the ones that asked for help. Uh, we know the ones that have trash out front. Um, I don't know to what extent the city can make, you know, a, a recovery guide for folks that, that's short and visual and, and isn't scary. But but folks do need to know that they, they need to move those things up. And uh, if you're moving an electrical panel up, you know, now, now is the time. When your walls are open, when your floors are open, right, a lot of these homes have their floors removed. Um, it is significantly cheaper to move an electrical panel now um, or replace a furnace with something that, that fits better now than, than to uh, replace it now, not knowing you need to then replace it in the future. So I would implore the city to more actively, uh, not just publish press releases and, and put things on front page forum, um, but, but either use volunteers or individually just go door to door to the impacted houses and, and help people navigate an expensive time of their lives. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, do, you have, do you have a response to that, Mike, or just take that for what it's worth? Um, yeah, no, the recovery guide's a good idea. And uh, it's understandable, The the in general, the, the plumbing, which is the HVAC and furnace and electricians, we don't do um, those permits. 
but because we've got the flood hazard rules, uh, they come in. So generally, they don't need to be doing that. So it is fr from their standpoint, they're not they're not wrong. Um, usually, it doesn't come into a uh, come into effect on them. This is one of the few times that it does come into effect on them. Um, and the state electrician and the the state plumbers are trying to get the word out from from above to let people know that these are actually the the requirements as they apply through FEMA and NFIP. Um, so, yeah, and the recovery guide is an, is an excellent idea. We're as I said, we have a meeting tomorrow, um, and I'm going to bring that up as as one of the options for us to to consider. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and if I can help at all, let me know. Uh, Christy Binzen. Oh, I thought we had you there for a moment. Okay. Oh, Sorry, sorry, in and out really fast. Hi, I'm Christy Benson. I live over on Franklin Street. Um, my question circles back to this conversation about moving furnaces and utilities up into the main floor of your house. And one question, one part of that question is about what financial resources will be available to help people do that. And the other part of the question is just the logistical practicalities. Like, is everyone's house going to accommodate something like that? And how do we imagine that happening? So thank you for taking my question. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's it's going to be a challenge and it's going to be a case um, a case by case as we help um, individuals. As we've had some conversations with people so far, we've talked about um, uh, potentially putting a small addition on the back of a house um, and really, let me back up a half step to say the requirement is it has to be two feet above the base flood elevation. So in certain places, that's going to that's going to differ as to, you know, in some cases, elevating it a little bit in the basement may get you high enough. Um, but for the most part, if you've got flooding in the basement that flooded your furnace, um, chances are good the base flood elevation is higher than that. So that's why we say the first floor. Um, a lot of older furnaces are very big. Many of the modern ones are are, are smaller. They're much more compact. So, uh, you know, uh, trying to fit them into, you know, taking away a half a closet. Um, you know, we talked to some large commercial, you know, if you have a big building and you've got uh, 12 apartments in it, then, you know, that may mean going from a three bedroom to a two bedroom for one of the units on the first floor and taking a bedroom or losing an apartment. and. We don't really want to be doing that, but as we look at the other equation of, we want to be more resilient, how can we be more resilient? Um, and one of the things is all of the buildings that have been built over the past 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, that have been built to flood standards, none of them suffered any damage in this flood. So if you want to know how can we be more resilient, the answer is meeting flood codes. But it's expensive, and that gets to your second point. How do we help people do that? Um, and obviously, if we knew this flood was coming in July, we would have been preparing last year to make sure we had grants ready for people. But we, we've got to kind of work on the fly now to say, all right, here are the rules, and if everybody does this, and everybody's supposed to do this, we're going to be a much more resilient community coming out of this than we did coming into it. We will be much more resilient. Um, but we've got to try to find, and that's uh, goes to the question that was earlier. What about you know these FMA? I mean, if there's something on emergency emergency management, there's certainly alphabet soup. So um, of grants and opportunities, and we are currently just reading 600 page things just to understand is this is this eligible? Will this help us? How can we how can we use this tool to bring some additional resources? But it's going to take time. Even if we find a great grant we might not get the money to the city until next year. Um, so that's why we're trying to see maybe some of these things are reimbursable after the fact. Somebody made that point, I don't know. It may be reimbursable under this grant, not under this grant. So maybe we have to consider that's a better grant. Um, and we'll, we will look at that. We know, and we're trying to get if, and here's another request out to the public. If you've got, um, Bit, uh, uh, numbers and estimates, 
if you can get them to my office, we would love to have them because as we communicate to people, they're like, what's it going to cost to raise an electrical panel in a house? I don't know. Uh, but if pe as people get us information, we can then turn around and give that information back to say, well, we've seen a range from this to this, depending on what your house is, how big your house is, how much, you know, obviously a, a eight unit building is going to have a bigger electrical panel than a single family home. Um, we we want we would love to have information. If you have information, get it to us. But we we were going to get to that down the line. We want to make sure we use this first time right now to get people, as Tim had pointed out, we got to do a better job getting information on the permits out. But eventually, we want to get we want to get these cost estimates because it helps us get information back to you, and it helps us know how much money do we need to apply for at the federal government. Um, because we need to be able to tell the federal federal government every electrical panel is going to cost X thousand um, dollars, and we have this many panels that need to be moved, and um, this is how much money we need to to make our community more resilient. Um, and so I hope that kind of gets around to answering the question there. Thanks, Mike. Um, while Thanks, we were while I was hearing a bunch of answers, I I got a text from a legislature saying what is taking so long to up and open State Street in front of the Capitol. So I promised that I would ask. Um, well, some of it is they've asked us, the state has asked us to keep it closed while they do repair. So um, <laughs> they may want to ask BGS that question and not us. Um, but part of, you know, uh, because they have those big heavy equipment and major things down there. So they've asked us if we would keep it closed. Oh, that's good to know. Thanks. Um, let's see, going to people who have not spoken yet, uh, Barbarina. Hi there. Um, I have a few quick related questions. Just has the city done a canvas or a survey of how many people lost their housing during the flood? Do we have any numbers? I've talked to Rick DeAngelis and I've talked to Connor Casey and I've heard some pretty high numbers, but I wonder if the city had gone door to door to find out how many families are currently, have lost their housing. All right, does anyone have an answer to that? I don't think we've gone door to door. We've, we've operated off of information that's been turned over to us from those individuals or building owners that reported displaced housing. And do we have a total? You could say also that we're working on compiling that. Yeah, that is something we are on. Um, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to give a number because I think it is incomplete. Uh, so I, we're, we're aware of one major apartment building that everybody was displaced in um, and a couple of people that were uh, hit, some people that were moved, but we don't have a total number. According uh, to Rick DeAngelis, there are dozens of families who are trying to navigate camping and there are increasing conflicts with landowners. And okay, so, so, that's a, so there's a different issue there. Um, so there are people that have been displaced as a result of the state's hotel programs. You no, this is because of the flood. Okay. People have been displaced because Montpelier of the flood. Montpelier residents? Montpelier residents. All right. Well, I'm going to be seeing Rick tomorrow, so I will ask follow up with him because that's, that is not information we have. But a question that I had, given that the city owns the Elks Club property, and because Rick said there's increasing conflict between people who are camping and property owners, whether the city could open up that for sanctioned camping and maybe ask the National Guard to build 20 outhouses so that people had sanitation and whether people could access potable water from the Elks Club building. It just feels like it's, it's a pretty challenging summer to be camping. I've done a lot of camping and this is not the summer I would choose to camp in, especially not having access to reliable potable water sanitation. And my understanding is that elected officials, even municipal ones under these kind of natural disasters have emergency powers where they can ask for things from the National Guard. You need to pay for them. 
but like getting a bunch of outhouses built, requesting camp stoves, and giving people access to potable water just feels like in this kind of a humanitarian crisis that might be a strategic and a compassionate thing to do. So um, it's a great idea. Like I said, I'm meeting with Rick about shelter, emergency shelter, uh, it's either tomorrow or Friday, and uh, we'll get on that. You know, we the city does have a camping policy uh, that we follow, and we are aware of some people that are already camping up there. Uh, so uh, those are good suggestions. We'll follow up on it. Thank you. Thanks, Barbarina. Um, I want to look over the list to see if there's anyone who hasn't spoken yet uh, before I go back to people who have. And I'm not seeing anyone, so I'll go back to Connor. Hi, thanks, Jack. And sorry, I, I cut out a little bit, so maybe you covered this, but I just think, um, it's one of those times where we have to be creative and nimble, find all solutions. Um, and what Barbarina just said and what others have said, like we have people that need to find housing temporarily. And the fact that we have a space at the top of the hill that is available and is usable, I think we should use every ounce of our energy to try to make that happen. And I, I got to be. I got to say, like it, it's stunning to me that we haven't made that happen yet. So, if we need legislative action, state action, like we have people that need housing, and we got to make that happen. It, it, it's just unfathomable to me that we're going to send people to the Barry Auditorium when they just need temporary housing. But again, thank you for all you do. You guys are working overtime but we have a solution and it's right next door. Thanks, Connor. Um, Casey Whiteley. Thanks. Um, I just, I just want to second what Barbarina and, and uh, Connor have just said that, you know, between the dorm space up at, up at the college and, and this new property that we have, I, I mean, great. We have a camping policy, but this is a catastrophe and we need to, we need to respond to it. Um, and then I just wanted to, so I wanted to support that that point of view uh, strongly. I just want to go back to what um, Mike was saying about everybody moving their utilities upstairs. Um, you know, I I I lost. I live in an 1880s house on St. Paul Street, and I lost my hot water. I lost my furnace, and honestly. I wanted some hot water. I didn't want to wait for uh, anything to be moved upstairs. And I didn't even know about that until tonight's meeting. So I've already installed a hot water heater that I didn't, that's not as nearly as good as the one I lost. And um, so I, and I'm on a, I'm on a fixed income. So when you're talking about these major, huge, like home, ch ch home improvements and changes and like the cost of wiring to move elect electrical boxes and things like that, it's like, I don't know. I, 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 there's no way I could afford to do any of that. And I honestly have to say that. So I just want to put that into the hopper. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, all right. On our agenda, I'm, I want to give people plenty of time to, uh, to come in with any, uh, comments or questions they may have that have not been addressed. A part of what we have on our agenda for tonight is the frequently asked questions page. I don't think we need to go over uh, what's in that document, but I think we do want to make sure that everybody uh, watching and everyone in the city knows that we have a page on the city's webpage that addresses a whole bunch of questions um, some of which have probably come up tonight and others which have not, but have been asked by a lot of people. And uh, and that's a living document that thing, things get added to it as we find out there are more questions being, uh, being asked. Tim. Yeah, yeah, just one quick question that's occurred to me listening is, so the, the whole cleanup operation is happening and thanks to those guys who are out working in this heat doing that, it's awful work uh, and they're doing an incredible job. 
but how long will this go on? I guess is my question. And uh, it, it seems like people are starting to abuse it. We're starting to see trash coming in from outside the flood area where people are just dumping off, um, sadly. So I think we, we're gonna have to define a limit, say we picked up once in front of your property or that's it. But I think we have to start telling people when it's gonna end because they're gonna keep putting things out just thinking it's gonna magically disappear. Well, yeah, I can I can address that, Tim. Um, so generally, there's a, a three pass policy for these uh, FEMA eligibility on removal, and um, we've just we're kind of still in first pass, and we do plan to message um, that that you know there is going to be a cutoff date. We're looking at um, you know, maybe two weeks uh, remaining of tra of debris removal. Um, so uh, yeah, we do plan to message that, and and there is going to be a definitive sort of cutoff date um, associated with that. And to Donna's point, like the white goods, I you know I expect they will also be taking second pass of um, construction debris removal at the same time. You know, there's two bays in those trucks, so one will be white goods, the appliances, and the other will be debris likely. Um, but we do plan to message that soon, and we'll get that out. Thanks, uh, Bill. Yeah, thanks. Um, I wanted to go back to the housing question that a couple of people raised, and uh, I'm going to probably give unpopular responses to this, but I think it's fair. Um, the Barry Opera, uh, Barry Opera, Barry Auditorium is the Red Cross and FEMA funded shelter for our region. They have cots, they have medical, they have food, they have mental health services, they're able to take pets. Um, they're, they're people do not need to camp. They can go to the Barry Auditorium and get those basic supplies. I understand it's not in Montpelier, but there is a whole support network around that. And that is what has is designated as, so these are Red Cross centers are set up on regional bases. And so the Barry Odd is the regional uh, center for these kind of things. So it's the whole Washington County area. And FEMA and everyone else is that's what they're going to pay for. They're not going to pay for additional sites. Secondly, um, I don't really, I've been reluctant to speak for Vermont College, but we have talked to them about this. And it's not that they're not willing to have it, but understandably, they'd like to get paid because they uh, usually get paid for rooms. And they want to know how we are going, we or whoever does it is going to provide basic services, including cleaning, including managing the population that's in there, including providing support services to them. And they have said that if somebody can provide, can present all of that to them, they will consider it. At the same time, they're selling their property to somebody else. So they're very concerned about the condition that it be sold as. So it's in a it's in a strange situation. So they're not refusing to do it, but they are asking for uh, understanding how how things are going to work. Their entire facilities people are in Colorado right now. They're not there to manage their own facilities. So there, it's not as simple as simply saying we are going to take their private property and put 150 people in it. And I can understand that people don't like that. And it is frustrating, but there are others. There are other things along with it. So I get it, and we can certainly take a look at what we can do at our own site. But we are told over and over and over again by people, you know, depending on the nature of the shelter that's being provided, that you need to have more support services than just a campground for people. So, um, and and as I've, we've talked, the city staff uh, is really full out on sort of flood recovery right now and don't have any wherewithal or, or money to do this. So that is why things are the way they are. Um, and again, there is uh, the last I knew, and I haven't checked this week, there was still ample capacity at Barry Odd to take more people. So um, there, there is a safe place for people to go. Uh, Barbara, very briefly, please. I, I don't know what the capacity is, but I talked to Rick two days ago and there were 200 households in the Barry Auditorium two days ago. And that's a whole lot. So just, 
I and guess you have more recent information than I have. So I will check on that for sure. Right. And I understand the complexities with the college. The other thing that occurred to me is we have a bunch of school buildings. I mean, it's not designated shelters, but the city owns them. They've got sanitation. They've got potable water. They've got places for people to plug in their phones. I'm just feeling for people who lost everything on the 10th and the 11th. And is there anything the city can do? I mean, I'm so grateful for the incredible volunteerism to help our businesses, but I'm hearing about families who are just in desperate, desperate situations. And if we do have properties, I guess just wondering, is there a way that we can as a city help? And just a friend of mine interfaces with FEMA a lot. And just after Katrina, FEMA paid for people to stay on cruise ships. <laughs> I mean, just they have, paid a lot of money and if the Barry Auditorium is a capacity, is there a way we can think outside the box to get people at least potable water, at least sanitation, at least a place to charge phones? That's and we have I'm heard that we have heard that FEMA under you know, depending on again, this is where an individual has to talk to FEMA, but they may put them in hotel rooms too. That there is that there are programs. Again, we don't control what FEMA does, but we are trying to work with them to do what we can. I just I really want to just address the issue that there was sort of a suggestion that there was some lack of effort or a lack of willingness on Vermont College's part to just take people. And I wanted to be clear that there's more complexity to that and that the, the funding mechanism is really built around the Barriott and this whole support network. So that was my main point. But if, if they're up to 200 households, then maybe they are at capacity. That is, that is news to me. Bill, I can tell you that I just got a text from uh, someone saying that he had heard that the Barry Auditorium is going to be closing within days. So I think that's something that we really need to be uh, looking into. I know you're going to be talking to Rick tomorrow, so um, that's just part of part of your conversation, I'm sure. Okay, just the updated info I just got from the police chief was that there were 22 people in the auditorium last night. So I think we need to ground truth some facts um, as well. And uh, this is this is uh, Bob Gowans. I just talked with one of the directors up there. They are still open and they have plenty of room at the Barry Auditorium tonight. Thanks, Chief. Um, folks, I there is a lot that we're going to be uh, dealing with over the coming months, and uh, and so I uh, I don't want to prematurely cut off this discussion, but I also know that this is far from the last conversation we're gonna have on this topic. So unless there's something else, I'll I'll move along. And uh, Lauren, I see your hand up. Yeah, just a couple of quick things. Um, one, just appreciate, I mean, I know the city has spent, you know, we've all spent a lot of time on homelessness. And so just encourage the, the staff and obviously I'm happy to help myself too um, in any way of just thinking creatively and trying to pursue and you know even having things lined up in case the Barry Auditorium closes and we still have needs and so on so um, and you know there might be a wave given what we're hearing of some other reports of like households and Barry and stuff so um, just just urge us to really um, pursue that as I'm hearing that city staff is saying that they will um, and happy to help. Um, also, just wanted to note, um, I hope part of the conversation, I, and I don't know what the city staff are putting out from um, about like heating systems and stuff, there are options like heat pumps that do not mean you have to change the layout of your, um, you know, upstairs or build an addition on your house. Um, so I, I just hope that there's information, there's incentives, there's zero upfront cost financing options, there's like a huge amount of effort the state is putting into helping people transition to cleaner technologies. You know, you've torn out your house, maybe it's a great time to weatherize. And there's there's like, if you're low income, you can get free weatherization services. There might be a long wait time for that. But anyway, there's there are a lot of programs, there's a lot of state incentives. So I just hope that somehow we're connecting those dots for people too. Um, so we're not like locking in a bunch of new fossil fuel systems at a time that we're trying to get off of them as we're dealing with a climate fueled emergency. Um, and lastly, just it was great to hear the interest in the community process on resilience. So I will follow up um, about that um, and just wanted to 
um, thank one of the people who was helping me think that through um, some ideas with was Paul Costello, who's an amazing community resource. I just wanted to thank him for um, helping me uh, think through some ideas. And I'm going to be following up with him and many others. So look out for that. Thanks. Yeah, Paul, Paul was on the meeting earlier uh, and is no longer here. I know there, there are a lot of people at, at the meeting, but uh, that's, that's what we have now. Um, I think we from now we can go right to council reports um, starting at Donna's end of the horseshoe. Okay, well, I'm going to start with some good news from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. They responded 100% willing to let the Law Station Theater move their rehearsal to their building, Noble Hall. They gave them plenty of rehearsal space, plus the kitchen, dining room. They were just so gracious to let them move in when the theater no longer had access to the city hall. And likewise, Barry Opera House, uh, it did cost them a little bit, but they made a deal with the theater to, to allow them to perform two shows of Adam's Family this past weekend. And again, it was community working together. And I, I think uh, when the situation is right, people wanna help when they can. But we can't all blindly help or we'd all have people in our own homes. Um, so there's limitations. So I just hope we consider those and recognize the good deeds we do even when we can't do everything. And just thanks to everybody for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Uh, Carrie. Um, just want to say thanks to um, the debris removal folks for coming down St. Paul Street today and cleaning up St. <laughs> Paul Street. We were we were prepared to wait a long time, and it's very nice to have the trash cleared away. Debris. Uh, Sal. Um, well, I, I just um, I guess I, I just want to say that I appreciate the uh, what what I heard today from the city about their appreciation for the sort of pickle that people are in, particularly financially with the kinds of replacements and repairs that they may need to make. Um, I hope we pursue that vigorously. I wonder if we can do more along the lines of the things Lauren was talking about to help people realize that it's an ideal time to weatherize and, and maybe replace um, fossil fuel technology. I mean, the, the cost, unfortunately, I think, is an obstacle for a lot of people. I don't know if what we can do in the short term, but added to our list of grant research to do might be um, some energy related stuff since we still have a few months uh, before people are gonna need that, I, I hope. Um, so thanks for all of that. Thanks, Sal. Tim. Echo the tone of comments with thank you. It's It's been an amazing, experience for us. I mean, people we don't even know coming into our house and carrying muck out of the basement and sheetrock pails. Um, just the outreach of people helping people in this town is is astounding and gratifying. And um, yeah, having one crew member who's on one of our buildings sitting on the steps taking a break one day, who just come from a, another disaster in Florida and said, you know, this town is really amazing. He said, I've, I've been other places. I've never seen a place where people come together like this and, and do this. So that was kind of neat to hear from a young guy. Um, and I'm also, you know, as my role in the Montpelier Foundation, I have to say people are also donating their treasure and they're, they're, they really are donating to help each other. The financial uh, donations that are coming in to help the citizens and businesses in Montpelier are just, it's really gonna help and it's gonna make it help us to bring it back. So. Thank you all, and, and also thank you to the city team, um, you know, watching you, They're kind of working in similar circles, running around downtown the last two weeks. Uh, everyone I've seen at every level has just been incredible, um, making things happen and, and helping us get back. So, cheers. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, just just echo that really inspiring, all the all the volunteers, Montpelier Alive has been an amazing partner stepping up um, and just so much gratitude to go around. Um, the, I know that um, the one kind of committee update, the energy committee uh, did talk about uh, potentially serving as a resource. We recently set up an outreach committee. Um, so we might be able to be someone who could help uh, pull together resources on what's available for, um, you know, 
clean energy and efficiency um, incentives and things like that that people might be able to access. So just just sharing that there's some interest in that we're, and we're trying to meet soon to explore how we could potentially be a resource for community members right now as they make decisions about re, um, rebuilding. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Mayor's report is is quite a, quite a bit the same of tremendous gratitude for the uh, for all the work. I've been uh, meeting down at the hub with uh, with the manager and department heads and uh, people coordinating the volunteers to talk about well what what are our needs for today? What are we going to do? What are we going to ask FEMA and the National Guard and all these guys to do and uh, seeing the people coming in and volunteering showing up to pick up shovels and gloves and shovel out people's uh, commercial properties and uh, and homes has been great people coming down unasked to just come down and say well i'm just gonna stand out here for as long as it takes and cook meals for people so that the volunteers who are uh, who are coming down uh, don't have to deal with trying to find find lunch while they're doing it. It's just a tremendous outpouring of support. Um, people love this community and you can see why. And we've got plenty of work ahead of us, but I, I really appreciate everything that uh, people have done. City clerk's report. I don't have anything. Okay. Okay, city manager's report. It's been it's kind of all you all the time tonight, Bill. I, but maybe you have more. I do have more, actually. Uh, just a, a little bit more um, on Barrier. Just to close that loop, uh, we did our thanks to our folks, our public safety staff, who reached out while this meeting was going on. So we, we confirmed twenty two people in the odd last night. Um, and that they are not families, but only individuals. There were 22 individuals, were not families. And they are looking to wind that down because it's, uh, there are not that as many people there, um, but they, they haven't made a final decision about that yet. Um, just to prove that we're not, that I am not all Cole Blackheart, um, recognizing that homelessness and shelter is a big, uh, thing. Um, I am meeting with Rick DeAngelis and the, the team on Friday about winter shelter that is still very much uh, on our minds. So I will certainly get his take on what the, the situation is in Washington County. Um, currently, uh, they were almost ready to go uh, with a, a either a winter or year round shelter at Bethany Church. And of course, they're, they're completely flooded out now. Um, and I, I don't know what kind of, I haven't been in the basement of that building yet to see what kind of shape it's in. Uh, so that is out. So they are talking to us and one, one option is the Country Club Road Elks Club site. Um, so we are going to be discussing that possibility. It's not the best location, but um, given the need and given the circumstances, I think we need to be open to that and uh, see what we can work out with them. So we're beginning that conversation. Uh, at least for this winter, uh, this week. So that is happening. The shelter is still on our minds, even while flood is happening. Um, to Lauren's question about um, energy, we are advising people to look at energy and um, specifically downtown businesses. Um, we've been reminding them that district heat would remind would uh, be a way for them to get furnaces out of their basements. Uh, we have at least one interest, very interested um, building owner and uh, potentially others. So uh, this is, you know, they're, while they're ripping their buildings out, I mean, and, and there's a lot of costs. Uh, while there's cost of hooking up, this is a good time for people to consider doing that. So if you're talking to commercial building owners and, you know, Tim, I know you do, uh, this is, you know, this is a good time. And as we all know, the more people we can get on, um, the lower the cost is for everybody. So it becomes, uh, you know, a kind of a self, propelling success. So we're trying to, to look at that, uh, to, to bring that to people's attentions. Lastly, uh, not the most popular topic, but um, the, the grievance process for reappraisals has been moved. Uh, it is now happening between July 31 and 8, August 4 at the Senior Center. So those hearings were all postponed and will be held uh, at those dates. So uh, basically the first week in August. That's all I have for now. 
Thanks, Bill. Great work uh, over, the, over these last couple of weeks. Uh, I really mean that. I'll follow up, Donna. Uh, what, before the meeting, I mentioned to Donna that my granddaughter just went to see the uh, Adams Family play the other day, and she told us it was the best play she had ever seen. So uh, she was very enthusiastic. And with that, we can adjourn at 8.46 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thanks, uh...